in the formation of our national government. Our fathers were surrounded with peculiar difficulties arising out of their novel. I may say unexampled. Condition and resolving to break the ties which had bound them to the British Empire. Their complaints were leveled chiefly at the king. Not the parliament nor the people. They seem to have been actuated by a special dread of the unity of power, and hence. In framing the constitution. They preferred to take the risk of leaving some good undone. For lack of power in the agent. Rather than armed any governmental officer with such great powers for evil. As are implied in the dictatorial charge to see that no damage comes to the commonwealth. Hence they adopted the plan of checks and balances. Forming separate departments of government. And giving to each department separate unlimited powers. These departments are coordinate and co-equal, that is. Neither being sovereign, each is independent in its sphere. And not subordinate to the others. Either of them or both of them together. We have three of these coordinate departments. Now, if we allow one of the three to determine the extent of its own powers. And also the extent of the powers of the other two. That one can control the whole government. And has in fact achieved the sovereignty. We ought not to say that our system is perfect. For its defeat, perhaps inevitable in all human things, are obvious. Our fathers, having divided the government into three coordinate departments, did not even try, and if they had tried would probably have failed, to create an arbiter among them to adjudge their conflicts and keep them within their respective bounds. They were left, by design, I suppose, each independent and free. To act out its own granted powers. Without any ordained or legal superior possessing the power to revise and reverse its action. And this with the hope that the three departments. Mutually co-equal and independent. Would keep each other within their proper spheres by their mutual antagonism that is. By the system of checks and balances to which our fathers were driven at the beginning by their fear of the unity or power. In this view of the subject is quite possible for the same identical question. Not case. To come up legitimately before each one of the three departments. And be determined three different ways. And each decision stand irrevocable. Binding upon the parties to each case. To say that the departments of our government are coordinate. Is to say that the judgment of one of them is not binding upon the other two. As to the arguments and principles involved in the judgment. It binds only the parties to the case decided. But if, admitting that the departments of government are coordinate, it be still contended the principles adopted by one department. In deciding a case properly before it, are binding upon another department, that obligation must of necessity be reciprocal. That is, if the president be bound by the principles laid down by the judiciary, so also is the judiciary bound by the principles laid down by the president. And thus we shall have a theory of constitutional government flatly contradicting itself. Departments coordinate and co-equal and get reciprocally subordinate to each other. That cannot be. The several departments. Go far from sovereign, are free and independent, in the exercise of the limited powers granted to them respectively by the Constitution. Our government indeed, as a whole, is not vested with the sovereignty, and does not possess all the powers of the nation. It has no powers such as are granted by the Constitution, and man and many powers are expressly. The nation certainly is co-equal with all other nations and has equal powers. But it has not chosen to delegate all its powers to this government, in any or all of its departments. The government, as a whole, is limited, and limited in all its departments. It is the especial function of the judiciary to hear and determine cases. Not to establish principles, nor settle questions. So as to concede any person with the parties and privies to the cases adjudged. 
Its powers are specially granted and defined by the Constitution, Article 3, Section 2. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution. The laws of the United States, and treaties made. And which shall be made, under their authority. To all cases affecting ambassadors, other ministers. And consuls. To all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. To controversies to which the United States shall be a party. To controversies between two or more states. Between states and citizens of. Between citizens of different states. Between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states. And between the state. Or the citizens thereof. And foreign states, citizens, or subjects. And that is the sum of its powers. Ample and efficient for all the purposes of distributive justice among individual parties. But powerless to impose rules of action and of judgment upon the other departments. Indeed. It is not itself bound by its own decisions. For it can and often does overrule and disregard them. Ask. In common honesty. It ought to do, whenever it finds. By its after and better lights. That its former judgments were wrong. Of all the departments of the government. The president is the most active. In the most constant in action. He is called the executive, and so. In fact. He is, and much more also. For the Constitution has imposed upon him many important duties granted to him great powers which are in their nature not executive. Such as the veto power. The power to send and receive ambassadors. The power to make treaties. And the power to appoint officers. This last is not more executive power when used by the President than it is when exercised by either House of Congress. By the Courts of Justice or by the people at large. The president is a department of the government. And, although the only department which consists of a single man, he is charged with a greater range and variety of powers and duties than any other department. He is a civil magistrate, not a military chief. And in this regard we see a striking proof of the generality of the sentiment prevailing in this country at the time of the formation of our government to the effect that the military ought to be held in strict subordination to the civil power. For the Constitution, while it grants to Congress the unrestricted power to declare war, to raise and support armies, and to provide and maintain a navy, at the same time guards carefully against the abuse of that power by withholding from Congress and from the army itself the authority to appoint the chief commander of a force so potent good or for evil to the state. The Constitution provides that the President shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, and of the militia of the several states when called into the active service of the United States. And why is this? Surely not because the President is supposed to be. Commonly is. In fact, a military man, a man skilled in the art of war qualified to marshal a host in the field of battle. No, it is for quite a different reason. It is that whatever skillful soldier may lead our armies to victory against a foreign foe, or may quell a domestic insurrection, however high he may raise his professional renown, and whatever martial glory he may win, Still he is subject to the orders of the civil magistrate. And he and his army are always subordinate to the civil power. And hence it follows. That whenever the president in the discharge of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed has occasion to use the army to aid him in the performance of that deity. He does not thereby lose his civil character and become a soldier subject to military law and liable to be tried by a court-martial, any more than does a civil court lose its legal and pacific nature and become military and belligerent. 
by calling out the power of the country to enforce its decrees. The civil magistrates, whether judicial or executive, might of necessity employ physical power to aid them in enforcing the laws. Whenever they have to deal with disobedient or refractionary subjects, and their legal power and right to do so is unquestionable. The right of the courts to call out the whole power of the country to enforce their judgments is as old as the common law. And the right of the president to use force in the performance of his legal duties is not only inherent in his office, but has been frequently recognized and aided by Congress. One striking example of this is the Act of Congress of March 3, 1807, 2. Statue at Large 445, which empowered the President, without the intervention of any court, to use the marshal, and if he be insufficient, to use the army summarily to expel intruders and squatters upon the public lands. And that power has been frequently exercised, without, as far as I know, a question of its legality. While the judiciary and the president, as departments of the general government, are coordinate, equal in dignity and power, and equally trusted by the law, and their respective spheres, there is, nevertheless, unmarked diversity in the character of their functions and their modes of action. The judiciary is, for the most part, passive. It rarely, if ever, takes the initiative. It seldom or never begins in operation. Its great function is judgment, and, in the exercise of that function, it is confined almost exclusively to cases not selected by itself, but made and submitted by others. The president, on the contrary, by the very nature of this office, is active. He must often take the initiative. He must begin operations. His great function is execution. For he is required by the Constitution, and he is the only department that is so required. To take care that the laws, all the laws, be faithfully executed. And in the exercise of that function, his duties are coextensive with the laws of the land. I am clearly of opinion that, in a time like the present, when the very existence of the nation is assailed by a great and dangerous insurrection, the President has the lawful discretionary power to arrest and hold in custody persons known to have criminal intercourse with the insurgents, or persons against whom there is probable cause for suspicion of such criminal complicity. And I think this position can be maintained, in view of the principles already laid down, by a very plain argument. The Constitution requires the President, before he enters upon the execution of his office, to take an oath that he will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and will, to the best of his ability, preserve, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. The duties of the office comprehend all the executive power of the nation, which is expressly vested in the President by the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, and, also, all the powers which are specially delegated to the President, and yet are not, in their nature, executive powers. For example, the veto power, the treaty-making power, the appointing power, the pardoning power. These belong to that class which, in England, are called prerogative powers, inherent in the crown. And yet the framers of our Constitution thought proper to preserve them, and to vest them in the President, as necessary to the good government of the country, and all these are embraced within the duties of the President, and are clearly within that clause of his oath which requires him to faithfully execute the office of President. All the other officers of the government are required to swear only to support this Constitution. While the President must swear to reserve, protect and defend it, which implies the power to perform what he is required in so solemn a manner to undertake. And then follows the broad and compendious injunction to 
take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And this injunction, embracing as it does all the laws, constitution, treaties, statutes, is addressed to the President alone, and not to any other department or officer of the government. And this constitutes him, in a peculiar manner, and above all officers, the guardian of the Constitution, preserver, protector, and defender. It is the plain duty of the President, and his peculiar duty, above and beyond all other departments of the government, to preserve the Constitution and execute the laws all over the nation. And it is plainly impossible for him to perform this duty without putting down rebellion, insurrection, and all unlawful combinations to resist the general government. The duty to suppress the insurrection being obvious and imperative. The two acts of Congress, of 1795 and 1807, come to his aid and furnish the physical force which he needs to suppress the insurrection and execute the laws. Those two acts authorize the President to employ for that purpose the militia, the army, and the navy. It is the President's bounden duty to put down the insurrection. As in the language of the Act of 1795, the combinations are too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings or by the powers vested in the marshals. And this duty is imposed upon the President for the very reason that the courts and the marshals are too weak to perform it. The manner in which he shall perform that duty is not prescribed by any law. With the means of performing it are given. In the plain language of the statutes. And they are all means of force. The militia, the army, in the navy. The end, the suppression of the insurrection, is required of him. The means and instruments to suppress it are lawfully in his hands. But the manner in which he shall use them is not prescribed. And could not be prescribed. Without a foreknowledge of all the future changes and contingencies of the insurrection. He is, therefore, necessarily, thrown upon his discretion. As to the manner in which he will use his means to meet the varying extension seas as they rise. If the insurgents assail the nation within army, he may find it best to meet them with an army and suppress the insurrection in the field of battle. If they seek to prolong the rebellion and gather strength by intercourse with foreign nations, he may choose to guard the coast and close the ports with the navy as one of the most efficient means to suppress the insurrection. And if they employ spies and emissaries to gather information to forward rebellion, he may find it both prudent and humane to arrest and imprison them. And this may be done either for the purpose of bringing them to trial and condign punishment for their crimes, or they may be held in custody for the milder end of rendering them powerless for mischief until the exigency is passed. This is a great power in the hands of the chief magistrate. And because it is great, and is capable of being perverted to evil ends, its existence has been doubted and denied. It is said to be dangerous. In the hands of an ambitious and wicked president. Because he may use it for the purposes of oppression and tyranny. Yes, certainly it is dangerous. All power is dangerous. And for the all-pervading reason that all power is liable to abuse. All the recipients of human power are men. Not absolutely virtuous and wise. Still it is the power necessary to the peace and safety of the country. And undeniably belongs to the government. And therefore must be exercised by some department or officer thereof. Why should this power be denied to the president? On the ground of its liability to abuse and not denied to the other departments on the same grounds? Are they more exempt than he is from the frailties and vices of humanity? Or are they more trusted by the law than he is trusted? In their several spheres of action, having assumed that the president has the legal discretionary power to arrest and imprison persons, 
who are guilty of holding criminal intercourse with men engaged in a great and dangerous insurrection. Or persons suspected, with probable cause, of such criminal complicity. It might seem unnecessary to go into any prolonged argument to prove that, in such a case, the President is fully justified in refusing to obey a writ of habeas corpus issued by a court or judge. If it be true, as I have assumed, that the President and the judiciary are coordinate departments of government, and the one not subordinate to the other. I do not understand how it can be legally possible for a judge to issue a command to the president to come before him to submit implicitly to his judgment, and, in case of disobedience, treat him as a criminal, in contempt of a superior authority, and punish him as for a misdemeanor, by fine and imprisonment. It is no answer to say, as has sometimes been said, that although the writ of habeas corpus cannot be issued and enforced against the president himself, yet that it can be against any of his subordinates. For that abandons the principle assumed of giving relief in all cases of imprisonment by color of authority of the United States. An attempt to take an untenable distinction between the person of the president and his office and legal power. The law takes no such distinction for it is no respecter of persons. The president, in the arrest and imprisonment of man, must, almost always, act by subordinate agents, and yet the thing done is no less his act than if done by his own hand. As the political chief of the nation, the Constitution charges him with its preservation, protection, and defense, and requires him to take care of that the laws be faithfully executed. And in that character, and by the aid of the Acts of Congress of 1795 and 1807, he wages open war against armed rebellion, and arrests and holds in safe custody those whom, in the exercise of his political discretion, he believes to be friends of, and accomplices in, the armed insurrection, which it is his special political duty to suppress. He has no judicial powers and the Judiciary Department has no political powers, and claims none. And therefore as well as for other reasons already assigned no court or judge can take cognizance of the political acts of the President, or undertake to revise and reverse his political decisions. There is but one sentence in the Constitution which mentions the writ of habeas corpus. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2 which is in these words, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended, unless when, in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. We must try to construe the words, vague and indeterminate as they are, as we find them. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended. Does that mean that the writ itself shall not be issued, or, that being issued, the party shall derive no benefit from it. Suspended, does that mean delayed, hung out for a time, or altogether denied? The writ of habeas corpus, which writ? In England there were many writs called by that name, and used by the courts for the more convenient exercise of their various powers. And our own courts now, by Acts of Congress, the Judiciary Act of 1789, Section 14, and the Act of March 2, 1833, Section 7, have, I believe, equivalent powers. If by the phrase the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, we must understand a repeal of all power to issue the writ, then I freely admit bet no bet none but Congress can do it. But if we are at liberty to understand the phrase to mean, that, in case of a great and dangerous rebellion, like the present, the public safety requires the arrest and confinement of persons implicated and that rebellion. I as freely declare the opinion that the President has lawful power to suspend the privilege of persons arrested under such circumstances. For he is especially charged by the Constitution with the public safety. And he is the sole judge of the emergency which requires his prompt action. This power in the President 
is no part of his ordinary duty in time of peace. It is temporary and exceptional. And was intended only to meet a pressing emergency. When the judiciary is found to be too weak to ensure the public safety. When, in the language of the Act of Congress, there are combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, or by the powers vested in the marshals. Then, and not till then, has he the lawful authority to call to his aid the military power of the nation, and with that power perform his great legal and constitutional duty to suppress the insurrection. And shall it be said that when he has fought and captured the insurgent army, and has seized their secret spies and emissaries. He is bound to bring their bodies before any judge who may send him a writ of habeas corpus, to do, submit to, and receive whatever the said judge shall consider in that behalf. I deny that he is under any obligation to obey such a writ. Issued under such circumstances. Whatever I have said about the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus has been said in deference to the opinions of others. And not because I myself thought it necessary to treat of that subject at all in reference to the present posture of our national affairs. For, not doubting the power of the President to capture and hold by force insurgents in open arms against the government, and to arrest and imprison our suspected accomplices, I never thought of first suspending the writ of habeas corpus, any more than I thought of first suspending the writ of replevin, before receiving arms and munitions destined for the enemy. The power to do these things is in the hand of the President. Placed there by the Constitution in the statute law. As a sacred trust to be used by him. In his best discretion. In the performance of his great first duty. To preserve protect, and defend the Constitution. And for any breach of that trust he is responsible before the High Court of Impeachment, and before no other human tribunal.